Welcome. So let's talk about learning from normal work. Think about your employees, your frontline workers and technicians. I'll show you five statements and think about whether your employees would agree with these statements or disagree with, with these statements. Think about them. This is less about you. So, number one, when I make a mistake at work, I tell my team leaders so we can learn from it. Think, would they agree or disagree? Number two, errors are useful for improving the work processes. Three, my managers frequently ask us what makes it difficult to follow the rules and procedures. My managers are honestly interested in what's behind non-compliance. And number five, my managers welcome when people admit non-conformance. Now, you, you, you thought that your people may agree or disagree with them, but would you like your people to agree with all of them? Wouldn't it be a fantastic safety culture if we could observe those things in real life? And if so, the question is how we can get there. So what we are going to uh, cover, there are 10 points that we'll uh, learn about. Number one is how failure and success have the same causes, the same underpinnings. Number two, what is normal work and how to learn from it. What are constraints and how they differ from hazards. From that, how people adapt to constraints through workarounds and how that affects risks. We talk, we'll talk about industry guidance on learning from normal work, a range of tools that we can use. I'll show you a number of real examples showing how to find causes of accidents before they happen. We'll then cover some examples of questions we can ask that open people up, put them at ease, and let us learn about the constraints and challenges they are facing. From there, we will learn about how to implement it in an organization. And I'll show you three case studies from large organizations that made it happen in practice. Who is this session for? Safety, operations, quality, um, and related fields. People who are seeking the next phase of improvement, possibly experienced surprise accidents, or got close to zero and now want to go beyond zero. Leaders who want to begin their transformation journey from reactive learning to proactive or leaders who want to modernize their existing safety efforts, for example, behavioral safety, risk assessments and others. So, does it sound like you? Throughout my career, I've seen repeat and surprise accidents. I've seen the investigation findings completely missing the point. I've seen corrective actions unable to make meaningful improvements. And I've spent years trying to improve how we learn from accidents. And I've developed a number of industry guides and toolkits. But as important as it is to learn from failure, it is to late. So I decided to dedicate my efforts to find a practical way to find causes of accidents before they happen. And so I've read hundreds of papers, all the books which are out there. I worked with the uh, world thought leaders um, in this area. And then I applied and refined and made errors and refined more. 
And so after years of uh, practice and teaching others how to do it and implementing it with multiple organizations at local scale and global scale, I've refined the approach. And that's something that I would like to share with you today. It is about how we can learn when nothing goes wrong. The content that I will show you today is based on safety science, but is not limited to any particular field or school of thought. So you will see here the content from Safety 2, Human and Organizational Performance, HOP, but also many others, Human Performance Improvement, HPI, Human Factors, Engineering Psychology, Resilience Engineering, Safety Differently, System Thinking, Cognitive Psychology, and, and many others. But we will not talk much about theory, but we'll talk about how to implement um, this, um, those approaches um, in practice to reduce the risk and add value to your business. So, let's start. As an industry, we continually learn from incidents and over time we've become safer. But the companies that made good progress in the last decade and got close to zero by learning from accidents face a new set of challenges. The safer they become, the fewer incidents they have to learn from. With small numbers, the injury rate is no longer a useful indication, a useful matrix showing you how safe you actually are. Focusing on unsafe act, unsafe behaviors and unsafe conditions is no longer sufficient to further reduce the risk. And Leaders experience repeat accidents, which are copies of the past injuries, and that creates frustration and raises questions about the effectiveness of our controls. And so we need to find a way to learn and improve when unintended consequences are absent. Typically, we think that if a task is completed without an incident, it is a success. Only a very small percentage of all activities result in an undesired event, and the vast majority of activities are completed without a problem. And as a result, it's easy to think that no additional work is needed in the shadow of success. Does it mean, however, that all those activities that did not result in an event were executed perfectly? Rarely is attention paid to how the activities were completed, what challenges were encountered, and were seeds of a future accident evident. When there is an incident, it's easy to think that it happened because something went wrong. For example, somebody didn't follow a procedure. Similarly, when a job is completed without an incident, it's easy to assume that all procedures were followed, all controls were applied. However, when things go wrong in organizations, our assumption tends to be that something or someone malfunctioned or failed. When things go right, as they do most of the time, we pay no further attention. Success and failure are the thought, thought to be fundamentally different. We think there is something special about unwanted occurrences. And this assumption shapes our response. When wanted or unwanted events occur in complex systems, however, people are often doing the same sort of things that they usually do, normal work. And what differs is the set of interactions, patterns of variability, and circumstances. But that variability is normal and necessary and enables things to work most of the time. And when we look 
into how the work is executed when there are no accidents, we see exactly the same things that we see when we investigate accidents. People skip steps in the procedure, the tools are missing, they work under time pressure and fatigued, and so on. Success looks a lot like failure. So, normal work is about how people adapt to changing conditions and challenges as part of their job. For example, using a crane to lift a load. Every time an operator does it, there may be something different about the situation. For example, less time available than planned, additional people in the area, one person being off work, or correct tools not available, for example, lifting slings. It's easy to see how these things can increase the risk, and yet none of them would be classified as a hazard because none of them is a source of harm. And popular approaches to safety management focus on controlling identified hazards, but miss a whole world of organizational factors. Adapting to overcome these various challenges is part of what needs to be done. It is normal work. And so learning from normal work is about proactively looking into the things that make the work difficult and increase the chances of error or nonconformance. And so we've started highlighting the difference between um, hazards and those various conditions. Let's explore this difference in more depth. So hazards are typically defined as something with the potential to cause harm. And the list on the left shows a popular um, list of things typically considered as hazards. For example, electricity, chemical, noise, etc. Now, compare that with the list of things on the right-hand side. These things are called constraints, error traps, or performance shaping factors. For example, incorrect procedure, insufficient time, or unfamiliar situations. It's difficult to call these constraints hazards, as this is one of the reasons why typical risk assessment would not capture them. And in the bottom right corner, you see examples of adaptations. So if a procedure is incorrect, which is an example of a constraint, then people adapt to that situation and, for example, may develop their own unique procedure. Or if the correct tool is not suitable or not available, people may adapt and, for example, they may fabricate their own tools in the workshop as a result of that constraint. And now with hazards, which are typically the physical objects or energies, we try to control them and we apply the hierarchy of controls, which you see on the left hand side. And that may include we eliminate the hazard, or we substitute it for something less dangerous, or we apply engineering controls like guards and cutoffs, etc. If that's not possible, then we move into administrative, procedural and behavioral um, solutions. But now, this approach, although very important in managing and controlling hazards, is not working very well when we try to apply it to constraints. Because think about it, if a constraint is that a procedure is not aligned with how the work should be done in reality, then if we try to apply the hierarchy of controls to that situation and think, okay, can we eliminate the hazards? There is a mismatch between procedure and reality. Can we eliminate? No, eliminate procedure no, that doesn't quite make sense. Can we substitute it for less dangerous? No, because the that misalignment in a procedure is not 
doesn't have potential to cause harm, so substituting this uh, for less dangerous doesn't make sense. Now, it may be more effective to talk about improvements or optimizations, because clearly we need to update the procedure. But updating the procedure, providing information that people need when they need it, improving um, usability, accessibility, uh, providing the right type of tools when people need it. Those things are not hazards and therefore the hierarchy of controls does not apply very well. The other um, important element in safety management is looking at unsafe acts. And a popular belief is that unsafe acts are causes of accidents and so they need to be uh, corrected. And so examples of, of the unsafe acts may uh, include failing to follow the lockout tagout process, not wearing correct PPE, being distracted or having improper body posture. And now we can either stop at this point and start perhaps correcting these behaviors through different means, through feedback, through um, observations, etc. Et or we can try to use a different set of lens. A set of lens that may see these behaviors as a form of adaptation. And if we use that another lens, we may see something different. So for example, that following the lotto process takes almost an hour, but the equipment can be disconnected from electricity by removing a power plug. And that happens in one minute. The work is done in a remote location. There are no other people around and there is a maintenance backlog, which means I've got um, a, a number of jobs to be done uh, today. And I, I would like to do as many as I can, because if I don't, there are other implications for that. If we go for not wearing PPE, we may discover with the new lens that the gloves are slightly too tight, exerting constant pressure on fingers, leading to discomfort and pain. That, if we look into the distraction, we can learn that another process on the, uh, in the plant cannot continue without the input of that person. So this person is continually approached by a number of people who need uh, their input and information and advice and direction. Or we can see that the ergonomics training was five years ago and there was no refresher since. And for that particular load, there are no handles. It has awkward shape, <coughs> etc. So a new lens allows us to see new things. Now let's compare, if, if we want to uh, look at behavior, Let's compare the popular uh, approaches to behavioral safety and learning from normal work. And the disclaimer here, I understand that behavioral safety is on a spectrum and there are some very sophisticated solutions that look into the context um, that are grounded in proper science. And they are also quite rare overall. Um, and so I'm here, I'm, um, I will use something that I've seen as common approach um, in the industry rather than very sophisticated uh, techniques from the world of uh, behavioral science and functional behavioral analysis. So let's compare those. So typically or popular approach is that unsafe behavior, unsafe act is seen as the root cause of accident. With here approach um, and supported by modern safety science, unsafe behavior is rather a symptom rather than a cause, a symptom of how the work is arranged. And when we get to the examples a bit later, I'll show you what that, what that means. And also unsafe behaviors are often adaptations to overcome conditions that make completing the task difficult and impossible. Again, I'll show you the real examples of those adaptations. Um, then the focus of BBS, based on the uh, assumption, is that uh, we need to find and address the unsafe 
acts as per the agreed standard. With proactive learning, we focus on things that make the safe and efficient execution of work difficult. So a, a difference. We focus in BBS on behavior, in popular approaches often isolated from the work environment, and uh, with learning from normal work, we focus on uh, the things that make it difficult to do the work. And then improvement. So the improvements um, in BBS are mainly feedback through conversations to correct the unsafe behavior, whereas the improvements in proactive learning focus on the conditions that make it more difficult to do the right thing. So let's try our first example. So this illustration is based on a real video that I, um, I cannot show here due to the confidentiality reasons, but um, but this is a real scene um, from the workplace. And what you see is the operator standing on a machine um, trying to operate the controls. There is one control here, there is another one behind his head and another one um, here to the side of this column. And at the moment they are kneeling because they are trying to see something. Um, there is a um, so this, this uh, big piece of equipment is rotating at fairly large speed. Uh, clearly it's big and heavy and if the worker um, leans too much to the right or loses their balance, um, they may be hit by this rotating piece of equipment and um, possibly uh, experience a life-changing or life-threatening event. And so now you can consider this an unsafe act, right? So he's in an unsafe position. He's uh, standing on the machine rather than on the floor and is working in an awkward position, right? And so there is also a clear danger here. And so when we see that, it's very tempting to say, okay, um, do you know what's uh, how you can get harm do you understand the the risks do you understand the hazards or other forms of correcting that behavior but that approach would not help us to learn what they were adapting to so again if if you try to put a different set of lenses okay and now see this behavior as an adaptation you can ask what is this an adaptation to? So there are a couple things. Number one is the design of the equipment. So if they stood on the floor, um, they would struggle to uh, reach um, the control. So there is one here, there is another one here, and another one here. So they would struggle to reach those controls. So we've got ergonomics of um, the design uh, of that. Number two is they are looking into um, the, the equipment to see the rotation and the contact between the blade and, um, and the rotating part. And so if they were standing on the floor here with their hands on the controls, they would not be able to see what they need to see. Now, from there, we can ask, what do you need to see and why is that important to you? And what would happen if you didn't see that? The behavior serves a purpose. And so if they, uh, if they can't see what they need to see, there may be other forms of implications. So, for example, a quality problem, uh, an uneven surface, no imprecise control or other forms of damage. To, to that equipment that if happened would also have implication because then the, you may say quality department comes in and does their investigation uh, into that. So the worker is adapting to the constraints, to the design and um, the positioning of the tool on the machine in order to complete that effectively. And by asking questions that I'll show you examples later, about 
what makes it difficult, what do you need, is far more effective in terms of understanding what contributes to risk than jumping to uh, the corrective conversation about uh, the unsafe act, which, by the way, in this case, um, they may be very well aware of the hazards, but because of the design, they cannot complete the job differently. So, there is a growing recognition among different industries that we cannot wait for an accident to happen in order to learn and reduce the risk. So what you see here are guidance documents published by the Maritime, Aviation and Oil and Gas. And I had the privilege of um, writing the, the one for the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers, which is based on my work experience, um, supported by the many practitioners from the oil and gas industries who also worked in this uh, area. And there are a number of different tools that can be used to learn from normal work. So uh, they could be put on a scale. On the left hand side, you see uh, tools techniques that are quick and easy. But with that also comes less insight and less structure. On the right hand side, you see techniques that are structured and will take more time, hours and days even, but will provide substantially more insight. And so let's go through them briefly. So on the, uh, uh, the, the first one is a conversation. I'll show you um, uh, examples of questions that can be asked, but it's 10, 20 minutes, whether that's leadership conversation, safety conversation, where we're trying to learn um, why it makes sense for people to do what they do. Then we've got the um, post-job briefings, which may allow a little bit more time and structure. And then we've got conversational walkthrough talk through. So walkthrough talk through is a technique where we break the task into steps and then um, talk about each step one by one. Or we can make it more analytical where we have got a form and then we write down all the steps and we uh, then write down all the um, um, uh, constraints that make execution of steps difficult. We can take that further, integrate a learning with risk assessment, job safety analysis, do procedural walkthroughs, um, which are more detailed, and then we've got learning teams. Um, so learning team is a semi-structured conversation with people who do the job, um, trying to uh, understand what makes their work difficult. And finally, on the right hand side, we've got a combination of a procedure walkthrough with cross departmental learning team. And in one case study in a refinery, uh, they spent two days um, going through procedure step by step, um, and then uh, discussing together with people from different teams about what is problematic with these steps and mismatches with reality um, and how alignment between different teams needs to happen to enable effective execution of work. So I mentioned the conversations on the left hand side. So let me show you an example. Um, so here I'll show you a number of questions that you and leaders can use in order to learn from employees. So for example, what is getting in the way of completing this task safely and efficiently? What makes this job difficult? Next one, what do you need to be set up for success? Or what do you need to complete this work safely and efficiently? Please note the emphasis on the workers' needs. Their needs would be a priority. Next one is, what is the advantage of doing it this way? That's a very powerful question. Think about that um, uh, illustration of the guy on the machine with the rotating equipment. And so what you, um, uh, if we ask this question, 
we would learn that actually crouching on the machine serves an important purpose because it gives them visibility of the distance between the blade and the, uh, the rotating part, which allows them for a precise control and correction um, of, um, in order to, uh, to complete the job. And without it, they would not be able to do it, which then increases the likelihood of um, quality failures, for example. Next one can be, tell me about situations when you need to deviate from procedures or processes to complete the job. Again, you have a conversation and there is no non-compliance that you can observe. But you can ask this question and the rationale behind it is that non-compliance doesn't necessarily is black and white. It may be hap happening under certain conditions. So for example, you've got a lifting activity and Monday, Tuesday till Thursday, it's all going fine and everything is good, you, you people have all they need. But then on Friday, there is that another project uh, nearby and that we also have a lifting activity and that team comes in um, and borrow their lifting slings. And so now on Fridays, they don't have lifting slings, which makes them um, non-compliant with the lifting plan. And if you have that conversation on Wednesday, you would not see that. But by asking about the situations when they need to deviate, uh, you may learn about the problems on Friday. And please know the focus. Situations when you need to deviate, here deviation is seen as an adaptation rather than a, um, a form of um, poor behavior that stems from complacency or uh, some personal characteristics. And if we see that as an adaptation, it will shift the question, the type of question that we are asking, and will enable us to see more and learn more. <coughs> the next example I wanted to show you is an example of a walkthrough talkthrough. This particular walkthrough talkthrough um, is uh, done on a preventative maintenance of a lathe machine. And a walkthrough talkthrough is a simple technique that breaks the task into steps and um, discusses what makes each step difficult. So let's go through, through it. So here we see a list of steps copied from the procedure. So for example, review the oil level, number two, change the air filter, number three, check the machine air pressure is 85 PSI, and so on. In the middle column, we see the potential consequences if this step is misperformed. And the rationale behind that is different steps may have different potential um, outcome and different severity of that outcome. So there may be steps that if misperformed, release enough energy to in order to um, create a severe injury or death. And there are steps that do not have potential to release such energies. And so understanding the potential consequence for misperforming um, steps is an important prioritization tool. Because although here we see only five steps, in real life you can have a walkthrough talk through, through that covers 20, 30 steps. And if out of those 30, there is one that has potential to kill, then our prioritization effort needs to focus on that particular step to start with. In the third column, we see examples of constraints and varying conditions. And the rationale behind it is that different steps may be uh, affected, influenced by a different constraints. So for example, if we look into step three, this step is to check if the machine air pressure is 85 PSI because the incorrect amount of pressure may damage the equipment. And by talking to uh, the operators, we realize that the gauge shows the pressure in megapascals. So this means that the same pressure would be expressed with different numbers when using PSI 
and megapascals, and this can confuse the operator and lead to a mistake. And you see that this um, constraint uh, related to this gauge is unique to this step. Other steps have other constraints that influence the likelihood of a mistake or non-compliance. And finally, when we take the findings and discuss with the operators how to best address them, in step three, the easy fix may be to update the procedure to uh, use megapascals so that uh, the numbers match with what we see on the equipment. The next example is an example of a simple learning team. So in one of our workshops, a team was working with these large spools. And this is a seven ton spool being lifted with a standard 10 ton crane. And you see the size of the spool on the picture. The spool needed to be lifted 15 centimeters, six inches above the floor and moved across the room. You would think, well, okay, that's not that difficult to do, but it is. One of the things that we picked up on was that the operator was too close to this pool. And the reason was that there was a cable type system which was limiting where the operator could stand and what he could see, therefore requiring a spotter. Now, please note how the operator was forced by the work environment to be close to the line of fire. And so, with one set of lens, we can interpret it as an unsafe act, or with another set of lens, we can consider that a form of adaptation to how the uh, work was set up. So now, the spotter was on the other side of the spool and it was difficult to see each other. So they had to use verbal commands. When we started looking at the crane controls, it had left, right, forward and backwards type buttons on there. So depending on the orientation of the spotter versus the crane operator and the limited visibility, they could easily make a mistake in the direction they wanted the crane to move. So we decided that if they just use a remote control and then put some directional indicators using things like east and west and then line up the equipment so that everything was moving in the direction that they wanted. Now the crane operator could move around and he always knew what direction he was going. And by making this simple improvement, we eliminated the need for the spotter and for using verbal communication. And if you think about moving large loads like this, it could result in a life-changing injury if someone was struck by it. The team was able to identify constraints that could result in the mistake and eliminated the potential for the injury. And there are a number of important lessons here. Number one, if there was an accident, we would have found exactly the same things we found now. The conditions that will create your next accident exist today. Can you find them? Number two, any attempts to change the behavior of the operator without changing how the work was set up would have a very limited impact because their, their position was forced by how the work was set up. Number three, improvements that eliminated the risk of an accident were in managerial control and not in the control of the operators. Operators would not be in a position to source and purchase a different crane control system, but management definitely is. And number four, things that we found and addressed could not be categorized as hazards and therefore would not show up in the risk assessment. 
And so the simple example means that we had a small group of operators, three, four of them, two hours uh, of uh, conversation, one hour to learn about the issues, and the next hour um, brainstorm the ideas for and solutions for those problems. Now, when we applied a series of those learning teams in different workshops and different locations, we were able to um, reduce the number of injuries by 37% uh, over a period of uh, 18 months. And so you see that um, proactive learning or learning from normal work has potential to reduce number of accidents, even though it is being applied to activities that did not result in accidents. Here is an example of a complex learning team. So um, complexity here means that the uh, task we discussed was bigger and uh, the scope was bigger and that we had more people in the room. So in this case, um, we invited workshop operators, foreman, safety, operations leaders, logistics, manufacturing, facilities. We had nearly 20 people um, in the room and it was a long discussion spanning over two days. And we were focusing on what makes their work difficult. And we've identified over 30 improvement opportunities. And so, for example, operators told us that the information that they need, such as weight or the center of gravity or the type of slings, is not easy or convenient to access. There are just a few laptops in the workshop. It takes time to walk to them. There may be somebody using it. Or if you rarely use the computers, you could forget your password and it's difficult to locate the information that you need in the database. And all this takes more time than you have available to prepare for the lift. And sometimes people were not using it, relying on their past experience. We also heard that sometimes important information is not available in the database or is incomplete. And some operators who may be involved in those lifts do not have sufficient skills and haven't had the right type of training. So we went through those findings one by one and improved accessibility, availability, um, usability, ease of access, um, etc. And what is also worth highlighting is that this learning team has been done uh, or performed on a site that achieved zero accidents. And even so, despite there was zero accident, we still were able to identify many different conditions that um, were increasing the risk of a failure. So we talked about a number of um, different ways to learn from normal work. And so now let's compare learning from normal work with accident investigations. So here we see a few different uh, aspects. And so starting with the time it takes to train people. Um, it takes significantly less time to prepare people to start learning from normal work than it is to do the investigations. The typical investigation training varies between one day to five days. You can also do like a one year long courses, but um, with proactive learning, we need, depending on the starting point, uh, we need a couple hours um, to, um, to, to a day for uh, the introduction here. If we look into the investigation time that it takes, the investigating accidents takes significantly longer. It's hundreds of hours for a team for high severity, uh, whereas with learning from normal work, we've got a few hours up to 20 hours, perhaps, including all the preparation and, uh, and follow-ups. So again, significantly less um, time. With investigations, you've got failure and so loss and the conversations tend to be tense. People may be afraid of being honest. Whereas with 
learning from normal work, you don't have failure. So the, the conversations tends to be more relaxed and people are keen to discuss how to improve things. And also the focus is on conditions surrounding them. So that um, doesn't, um, that puts them more at ease as well because they are happy to, uh, to contribute. The typical findings in investigations, we've got failure of something, fail to follow procedure, failure of this or failure of that. Whereas with uh, learning from normal work, we've got things that make the execution of work difficult. The procedure is out of date and not available. So it's a different lens that we, uh, that we apply. Because proactive learning is a planned event, um, you can fit it into the uh, operational uh, reality and make it happen when there is lower workload or quieter time on the site. Whereas with incidents, it just interrupts whatever is happening at the time. And if you're running full steam, then uh, all that will be uh, interrupted. And so the financial cost, if you think about high severity incidents, they may reach hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars, if you account for both direct and indirect costs. And compared with that, the learning from normal work is super cheap um, because you've got really the cost of the learning team is time of people that spent, um, spent on learning plus cost of any improvement um, corrective actions. And so one calculation was that it may be 0.002% of a cost of an accident. So if you then compare one accident, you can do so many um, proactive learning efforts and learning sessions um, within, within, the same, within the same cost. So proactive learning is significantly more um, cost effective. Here is an example of how a learning from normal work can be integrated with GSA, job safety analysis. So, or this, which is a form of um, risk assessment and hazard identification. So typically, the, this task level risk assessment um, requires breaking the task into steps. For each step, identifying hazards, and then for each hazards, identifying controls. So what you see here is we see step three um, out of, this is an extract from um, a larger document. So uh, step three is close the valves and disconnect the hose from the tank. The hazards are chemical leak and that may result in um, injury and burn. And now we can add a column focused on constraints. It's helpful to articulate the what's the potential error and in this case the operator can disconnect the hose before closing the valves which would then result in a leak and how an error could happen because there is no visual indication if the valve is closed or open and the technician may think it was closed while it was open because the design allows to disconnect the hose with the open valve on the tank and so the controls would uh, be related to the, the hazards. So you've got training, uh, procedure, um, etc. But here you can look into the optimizing that constraints or addressing the uh, design issue and redesign the connection to make it impossible to disconnect the hose with the valves open. So now um, I would like to show you an example of questions that can help to uh, open uh, people up, put them at ease, and learn more about the constraints they are facing. So we'll start with an exercise. I'll ask you three simple questions, and please pay attention to the feelings that these questions bring up for you. Okay. I noticed you use a wrong tool. Did you follow the procedure? Why did you make this mistake? 
So how are you feeling now? Are you comfortable and willing to openly talk about your situation? Now let's try again with a different set of questions. Help me to understand your task. What makes this job difficult? How would you improve this process? How are you feeling now? Are you feeling more at ease? Are you more comfortable to tell the full story? Most people experience a big difference between these two question set, sets. Questions that close people down are often based on an unspoken belief that I, the observer, know better, and so I should check on the workers and challenge them. As I already know better, there is no need for asking about the context and constraints. These questions also focus mainly on the person. For example, I noticed you did you, etc. And sadly imply there is something wrong with you. And that's why people tend to react defensively or even aggressively to these questions. But such an approach leads to people becoming defensive, disliking the leaders, lowering the trust and perception that leaders don't listen or are not interested. Instead, we can start with an assumption that the people doing the work, not you, know better. And so the questions that open people up are based on an unspoken belief that people doing the job know the realities and dilemmas in their work environment better than those who are external observers. And these questions, on the other hand, focus on things external to the person. For example, your task, this job. And because of that, they do not threaten the self-esteem and make people feel more relaxed. Now, you may ask, okay, but we've got thousands of tasks happening. Where do I start? Okay, so you can start um, in a few different places. So number one, if you're not at zero and you've got incidents, take the existing trend. So for example, hunt injuries. Okay, start with that. And now don't focus on the injury, but rather identify the tasks that resulted in the injury. So the task may be lifting, it may be moving objects, it may be uh, putting things together, whatever this is. Because different tasks will have different constraints. And if we focus on injuries as a more high level category, we will not be able to understand the constraints um, that affect the, the task. And so then you, if you identify a few of those activities, you can start reviewing them um, with walkthrough, talk through learning theme or some other, other approaches. The next one is you look into the risk profile of your activity. So you can take your risk matrix, which typically identifies which activities have the high severity potential outcome. Uh, and you can focus on those that may be lifting, that may be pressure testing, etc. Um, and so that may be your starting point. Another data point may be your project plan data. So for example, when you um, that may be applicable for construction. Uh, projects. When you know that you've got uh, an increased number of people and activities uh, in an area uh, or other forms of input about, uh, about the risk, this is where you can focus on. There are some more advanced techniques, for example, like critical task screening, but I won't go into that uh, today. And another simple way is just talk to people. So if you um, go to sites and talk to the operators and ask questions about where do you think our next accident can happen? What do you worry the most about with regard to safety? They will tell you because they've seen near misses that were reported or not reported. They've seen weak signals. They've seen the constraints, issues and challenges that perhaps are not fully visible. And if you ask managers, they will also share. Typically, there is 
a difference between what managers are concerned about and what workers are concerned about. And both perspectives are valid because they come from different set of experiences and perspectives. But talking to people um, is also a very easy way to prioritize. So now with all this said, the question is, what do you need to make it work in an organization? And so having implemented that um, in many different um, companies, um, locally and globally, there are three things that needs to happen for this effort to add value and really bring the difference. And number one is a mindset. It's that shift uh, on how we think about accident causation, the role of behavior, the role of adaptations, the questions that we should ask, the what type of corrective actions are helpful. So um, without that, we can do our learning teams and walk through talk throughs and we'll see that leaders whose mindset is not aligned, they will push back, um, they will challenge and they will um, use unhelpful behaviors. So, for example, they may come back to the workers with criticism or, uh, or other, other forms of more or less formal penalties uh, that, um, that create more damage than help. So, mindset, um, mindset is key. Um, from there, there is a skill set. So, this is how we ask questions. Uh, in a way that focuses on constraints and in a way that welcomes people's input and um, make workers learning partners rather than objects of an investigation uh, or inquiry. And so those facilitation skills uh, and questioning skills really matter because there are many different subtleties that can close people down. For example, imagine we are talking to a group of crane operators and one of them says that um, John typically walks under the suspended load. And you know there are rules that they shouldn't be walking under the suspended load. And you even told them yesterday and here you're hearing that they still do that. Now, how you react and how you respond to that question can either make put people at ease and that allow you to learn more about the constraints and situation or will threaten them, close them down, make them defensive, and will not let you to learn more. And so the simple, so if you ask a question, for example, do you know the rules? That's the end of the conversation. You can ask more subtle question. How long has this been going on for? That's typically also the end of the conversation because it implies that if it was going on for a while, why didn't you say anything? There are rules, we could help you, etc. So, so it very subtly positions the blame, but people will feel that and that will close the conversation. Or you can ask, tell me more about this. Tell me what's the advantage. Tell me why it makes sense. And that would then open up um, a conversation about the constraints. So the skills really matter. And the tool set is about the understanding the structure of walk through talk through the structure of learning teams and so some so some of those other tools um, and techniques that can be used and all that now the question is how to um, implement it at scale and so that's something that uh, i also do because you can do small learning team here and there but how do you then um, implement it in a way that uh, permeates the organization and the sites and divisions become self-sufficient and integrated into the way they work. And all that has important strategic implications because with new mindset and skill set um, come implications for culture transformation. For safety strategy, if we think about our focus and how to apply, uh, apply resources and uh, the type of changes that will be done at the site level, country level, or global level, as well as there are uh, implications for leadership development. So how do we prepare leaders in a systematic manner to achieve the mindset that we want and give them the questioning and facilitation skills 
that consistently open people up rather than close them down. And so the uh, practical implementation um, can happen uh, in different ways. Uh, one starting point is a pilot-based approach, project-based approach. So we would pick up a site um, and then uh, prepare leaders to um, uh, prepare um, ab about what, what we would like to do. So typically that includes a presentation first, then typically training for the leadership team because we need them to be um, supportive and set the tone for and resource as well, the any improvements. And so that leads to that new tone and expectations. Um, then we've got the uh, pilot, so that may include any local leaders, um, facilitators, so this is where we do a deep dive into the questioning uh, techniques, and demonstration of value, um, showing the cost-benefit analysis, the quality of learnings, the benefits of, uh, of this effort. And once that's demonstrated, then that um, brings us to a conversation about how else we can integrate, where else we can apply, and um, where and what uh, is coming next. And typically, this is bespoke um, to the organizations. Um, but the uh, examples can include enhancing leadership visits, uh, revising risk assessments, revising behavioral safety, um, doing procedure reviews, and, uh, and others. So here I highlighted training. And so you may be asking, okay, so what does the training cover? How long is it? And so the uh, training that I've created um, is a um, comes in different forms. So I've got the e-learn online and face-to-face. -face. The content is aligned, but with different modes um, come different uh, different length. <coughs> so let's start with. Uh, the content. So the content has been designed to uh, build those three elements. So mindset, skill set, and tool set. And we start with uh, introducing a performance variability and that success is similar to failure. Uh, we go into the constraints and psychology of non-compliance and why people use uh, workarounds. Uh, we explore the gap between reality and um, planning work as imagined work is done, as well as talk about the uh, dependencies between teams and how they affect safety. Then we move into some basic um, biases that shape our interpretation of reality. So fundamental attribution error, which makes us explain behavior by referring to people's personal characteristics, which is a bias and scientifically uh, incorrect. Um, and uh, what you look for is what you find. Uh, which highlights that our mindset and mental model shapes the question we are asking, which then results in the information that we are um, we are obtaining. In chapter five, we um, explore the modern approaches to accountability. We provide an introduction to restorative justice and explore how holding people accountable, defined as applying punitive measures, can actually lead to more accidents and how to hold people accountable in a way that makes them more engaged in the future rather than less engaged. And from that, um, we cover questioning techniques and the tools, how to do walk through talk through, how to do a learning team. So um, here is a screenshot from uh, the eLearn. And the on the left hand side, you see the structure. So um, number of chapters, and within each chapter, we see a number of short videos. The videos are between uh, one to two minutes long. They are very crisp, concise, one point at the time. Um, and the, um, the, the, the content is professionally illustrated, and it mixes the introduction of concepts with the real story. Um, this is the story that is based on a true situation that I was um, ex exploring. And um, every time we introduce a concept, we show how this concept applies in real world. And so we continue one story and we go concept story, concept story. So, so you see uh, and the, that story evolves and brings in different, different characters to show how all this 
is applicable in practice. And so each, um, each chapter then is uh, followed by a short quiz as well as uh, a, a easy practical question to implement it. That may vary from having a conversation or finding out some uh, information uh, to solidify uh, the learnings. And so the, um, this ELEN can be taken in a couple different ways. Uh, it can be done just, you know, in one go. You just go through the content on your own, and that's fine. Um, but there is possibly even a more effective way of, uh, of learning. So every time we learn something, we have to deal with what's called forgetting curve. This is a representation of the fact that we lose the majority of information that we were exposed to fairly quickly. So, um, in order to uh, reduce the impact of that forgetting effect, we need to be able to um, revisit the content from different angles. And so, for example, imagine that on Monday you watched uh, two chapters from the eLearn, then on Tuesday you've received an email with a brief summary of the key points. And now on Wednesday you did, or on Thursday, you did your practical um, task, which took you 15 minutes, but requires, required you again revisiting. And on Friday, you meet with your colleagues who also watched the very same content, and you discuss your thoughts, impressions, examples, challenges to this. And so if, um, if you take the, the ELEN as a group and um, do it together and combine the learning with practical application and discussion, not only you will remember far more, but also um, you will align between your colleagues on what this means to us in our context, and you will be able to um, uh, together define how to apply it in practice far more uh, effectively. So eLearn is one way uh, of going about it. Then I also um, deliver uh, this training face-to-face -face and online. So face-to-face um, -face typically takes uh, one day, depending on um, the unique situation of an organization uh, and the examples and the exercises that you want to bring uh, bring in. It may take longer, but the um, the starting point is um, is one day. Um, online, it would um, be um, a number of sessions. So we wouldn't do eight hours uh, online. We would do either two half days or split it even further into four uh, sessions, two hours each. And so that would uh, also help with the forgetting curve. So um, let me show you what uh, other people are saying. So uh, Mondelez International is one of the largest food manufacturing uh, organization um, uh, selling some of the most popular uh, brands uh, of snacks uh, and food. And so they've learned, um, they heard about learning teams, but wanted a bite-sized structured program to enable um, the, uh, the, the leaders to get familiar with this and start uh, the implementation. And so they got together with the uh, senior leaders supporting uh, HSE integration across 60 manufacturing plants. And when they um, completed the training um, together, they've noticed the um, impact uh, that was less and more formal. So less formal was that those this different mindsets start permeating through um, different meetings um, and uh, different type of discussions about the strategy and planning and investigations and findings on top of um, the um, uh, proactive learning sessions and efforts. Ecopetrol is a uh, national oil company from uh, Colombia um, and they've heard about proactive learning and um, HOP and wanted to align their HSC uh, processes uh, with these approaches. And so uh, Ecopetrol um, put together a team working in different teams, including safety, process safety, occupational health, HR, operations, 
uh, and some others through that training. And they worked as a um, group, um, as a cohort together, uh, even though they were coming from different teams. And not only they enjoyed the course, it had a profound impact on um, how they thought about the next steps and how to um, change or update, enhance their processes, um, HSC conversations, and other elements of their safety management uh, system uh, based, based on that. Altus Intervention um, is a service company from the oil and gas industry. Um, and they wanted a different approach um, to safety, to refresh it, to um, bring in a new angle. Um, and uh, here Alistair says that for the very first time in a long uh, time, I could see a new angle to explore that might be the key to unlocking further HSC improvements. And so Altos took uh, a QHSC team together and put them through um, the training, discussions, reflections, and that enabled them to revisit, review, and enhance the uh, a range of different materials in their QHSC management system and integrate um, concepts of learning from normal work uh, into that. So um, there are more examples, but um, we also need to think, I need to think about the time uh, of this. So I'm here I'm here to help. Um, my background combines safety, psychology, training, um, business, system thinking, uh, and all that combines together into uh, practical application. And my experience um, comes from a number of different high-risk industries, and I also led uh, a number of working groups uh, focused on promoting um, those topics. Um, and uh, my work attracted the majority of uh, industry awards available in the oil and gas sector. So, if you feel that this is of, um, of use and I managed to spark your interest, um, this is what are some of the options. Um, number one is if you would like to share um, this concept idea of learning from normal work with your organization, with your leadership team, feel free to book uh, the awareness session. So I deliver uh, short and long sessions, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes sessions to leadership teams, um, just as an introduction, as a, as a, a constructive challenge uh, to how we can see safety via a different lens and facilitate the discussions or workshops um, around that. If you would like to start learning more and in more depth about uh, this concept, you can start with the eLearn and you can do it on your own or you can, um, you can do it with your team and do it as a self-facilitated session. I've got some guidance uh, as well, uh, some checklists, how to make it work, how to make it happen, or I can facilitate that for you uh, as well. So um, if that facilitated approach um, is, uh, you, you see the benefits of that, please reach out and the link to my uh, calendar uh, is in the description below. Um, alternatively, you can uh, book the online training uh, or face-to-face -face training. Um, and then uh, we can also talk about the practical implementation and how this effort could fit into uh, your existing uh, processes, priorities, strategies, uh, etc. So I offer um, group discount if, um, uh, if you would like to um, uh, share this, this content and training to um, uh, to, to, to a larger group of, uh, of employees. So with this said, thank you so much um, for uh, spending time with me. There are more resources on my website, learningfromnormalwork.com, more case studies, more articles, and this will be a growing resource of uh, material um, in this space. So with this said, please uh, check the links in the video uh, description, and I very much look forward to hearing from you. Stay safe. Thank you.